Okay, now let's open it to the floor. If there any question, please identify yourself uh, and then ask your question. The gentleman in front. Oh, merci, uh, Monsieur Leishoubi, académicien, ancien ministre algérien. Uh, L'intérêt de ces, ces espaces de, de réflexion, c'est de pouvoir faire le lien entre les différentes réflexions des différents panels. Alors, je voudrais très rapidement reprendre ce que vous avez dit. Vous avez évoqué l'intérêt de développer des zones dites marginalisées ou parfois des zones périphériques. Et euh, quand on regarde ce que certains ont qualifié être le système monde que l'économiste euh, avait, euh, coréen avait euh, qualifié de triade, on s'aperçoit que donc euh, ce système monde avait une asymptote, a eu des limites, puisqu'il a laissé des zones totalement euh, marginalisées. Et donc cette euh, idée, cette initiative est nouvelle de ce point de vue-là. Récupérer des périphéries, les remettre dans, dans le monde. Alors est-ce qu'on pourrait partager la réflexion critique que les différents panels, notamment ceux de ce matin, euh, quand on a évoqué la politique de, de Trump, certains ont on fait part d'altermoiement en disant on va attendre que Trump parte, que l'Amérique revienne et certainement nous allons avoir de nouvelles idées, de nouvelles visions. Lorsqu'hier je m'étais permis modestement de dire que dans les initiatives nous devions certainement avoir plus d'audace, alors est-ce que vous n'avez pas l'impression qu'il y a des espaces, des logiques qui ont atteint des asymptotes et que le monde a intérêt à leur dire qu'il faudrait qu'ils sortent de leur asymptote et que tout le monde se, se rejoigne, peut-être pour euh, tenter de créer une nouvelle vision avec euh, évidemment toutes les réserves, toutes les réflexions que vous avez évoquées, veillez à ce que ce nouveau système ne soit pas hégémonique, veillez à ce que ce système soit consultatif et qu'il apporte l'intérêt. Mais c'est clair que pour ces régions, le débat, se... et là, c'est différent, marginalisé, périphérie, subissant toutes les difficultés, aucune infrastructure, pas de structuration du développement, et on ne leur propose pas. Et quelqu'un vient et leur propose tout ça, il est évident que la tentation est là. Alors, entre la marginalisation et les nouvelles initiatives, est-ce qu'on ne devrait pas réinterroger nos amis stratèges dans ces espaces d'opulence de l'époque pour leur dire, est-ce que vous ne pouvez pas appréhender le monde différemment Et je vous remercie. And, any of the three panelists like to take a crack? Okay, I'll try to take a crack. So I think that uh, the current geopolitics, which seems to be fracturing uh, and uh, going back to the creation of inward-looking blocks, I see that really as a hiccup, as uh, Carlos Ghosn said. It's a hiccup in the arc of history because I think globalization is inevitable. And I think the leadership role that China has taken to actually say we're going to go to countries all over the world, build this connectivity, um, the US stepping out of that role uh, and not really taking leadership in that, Europe having its own issues at the moment, I, I think that there is a new space that's been created. And I think there will be a new global architecture. <coughs> I'm part of the BRICS for example, the BRICS Council, and I see interesting things happening there. I'm part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I see interesting things happening there. And I think it's really about us as a team. And I just want to repeat what uh, Dr. Bayou said, that we are very focused on sort of a very particular elite view of the world. The reality is today on the planet, the World Economic Forum data that came out a year or two ago says that if this room were 100 people, Eight people have 83% of the wealth. Eight people have all the food and drinks for the next three days for our conference. I think we would have a little crisis here. <laughs> uh, so I think that we need to really step up to the plate as global leaders and realize that our, what we're trying to do is not just about the zero-sum game of power politics that existed 100 or 200 or 500 years ago. I think it's very important for leadership to really grow up, move out of this adolescent stage. We need adults in the room who go, how do we actually get the planet functioning? Because it really is one world. With all the connectivity that exists today, everything is in everyone's mobile phone, in everyone's television. And I think that 
we're sitting on potentially a big disaster socially in terms of refugee crises and migration and many other problems uh, compared to what we have today if we don't really deal with the core issues of global economic growth, global economic leadership, political leadership, and actually constructive dialogue. Okay, on, Mr. On, Leung, and then Dr. Bayou, and then the gentleman in the middle. On, on the question of multilateralism, uh, I read in a Hong Kong newspaper report uh, this morning on the early results of the Japanese Prime Minister Abe's visit to Beijing, the first such visit in seven years. Um, the two countries announced six major points of agreement, one of which um, is the question of the two countries working together in third-party infrastructural projects. Now, this is multilateralism. It's not Japanese building projects in China or the Chinese building it in Japan. It's China and Japan doing it in third countries. So I think that's welcoming. Um, and it's a, a new, new development, and it really underscores the nature of um, BRI. Dr. Bayou and the gentleman in the middle. Yes, I think the, the only certainty on these issues is that the population of the, of the world is growing up, the demand for resources is growing up, and we need to come with the solutions. Because business as usual will doom us. And I think, uh, you know, we, we will welcome any initiative who are willing to take the risk and the effort together and solving their problems. You know, China is not all, always compelling for Indonesia. We have our history with, with China, but now we become, can be, become friends and we work together in so many aspects because we see the same threat. And the uh, uh, Belt and, and Road Initiative, that's the only notes that probably I could share with you, need to be an instrument to solve that problem. The gentleman in the middle, please. Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Cavistan again. Uh, in spite of what has just been said, it seems to me that there is a little chance for the Belt and Road Initiative of becoming a multinational or multilateral initiative. Uh, one of the figures you haven't mentioned is 89% of the investments of the infrastructure projects realized on the Belt and Road are uh, funded by China and, 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 uh, and built by Chinese companies. So, I mean, one of the things you haven't mentioned is uh, the reaction of the, <coughs> the US and, and Europe to the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's maybe one positive um, kind of uh, uh, indirect impact of the Belt and Road Initiative that uh, both the US and Europe have put together some money to build infrastructure and to finance infrastructure in uh, Africa and elsewhere. So this kind of reaction to the Belt and Road. But my question is about two issues you haven't mentioned very much. Profitability, profitability and debt. Sorry. Profitability and debt. Profitability. Yep. And debt. Two, and, and debt. debt. Yeah. Two weeks ago, I was in Djibouti and clearly uh, to, um, you know, for a conference, but I, I took advantage of that conference to observe what the Chinese are doing there. You, I'm sure, aware of the military base, which has been built uh, to last year, but none of the projects in which China has been involved is profitable. None of them. The train is losing money. The train from Djibouti to Addis Ababa. You have got two trains a week. They are losing money. I don't know whether they, I mean, and the uh, the Dorale uh, multi-purpose port is losing money. Um, and 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 there's a new free trade zone. Uh, there is no one inside, and built by China, which is losing money as well. So and then. Djibouti has um, a debt of 1.54 billion US uh, to China, and the GDP of, G of Djibouti is 1.8 billion. So, and Djibouti doesn't have the money to pay that debt back to China. So, what's going to happen? Maybe China is going to take over the Dorale multi purpose port. <coughs> Maybe another country will step in. But here, you know, the, these two questions need to be addressed because countries like Djibouti are really in a difficult situation to uh, pay back the debt and to make the projects which were financed by China profitable. So it seems to me, I mean, the, one of the drivers of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, at least in the part of Africa, seems to be much more geopolitical than economic. But the question for the Th time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. On the question of profitability, the Hong Kong experience, um, the Chinese experience, is that we don't look 
uh, the financial return alone. Financial return is important. Some projects have to, have to be bankable. But we also look at economic benefits and social benefits. If we just look at the financial bottom line, I'm afraid the underground railway system in Hong Kong will never have been built. The high-speed rail system in the mainland of China will never have been built, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's, and that's, that's one point. Um, as I said in my presenta presentation, uh, China is sharing its own experience uh, within uh, China with uh, other countries uh, in the world. Um, China raises a lot of debt uh, to fund its own infrastructural projects within the country. So they are not, um, they are not really sort of preaching without practicing. Uh, China is sharing experiences with, uh, with uh, other countries. Um, you also mentioned debt. Yes, that right. I, there was a, before Djibouti. profitability. It's the same, the same, the same argument. Um, these infrastructure projects are important, and one shouldn't just look at them as if they were pure commercial and privately funded projects. Last question, uh, last two questions. The lady at the end, and then the gentleman in front of her. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my name is Astana. I'm the Malaysian ambassador here in Rabat, so you'll understand why I've asked for the floor. I was quite pleased to hear um, some level of understanding on Malaysia's position on the issue, both from yourself, Ronnie, as well as Mr. Leung. Um, I think, Mr. Leung, you've certainly um, captured very well what the Malaysian position is vis-a-vis -vis our uh, the Prime Minister's uh, decision uh, in recent uh, weeks um, about the infrastructure projects in Malaysia. And at no point in time did the Prime Minister um, suggest that um, it was China at fault um, in coming up with these uh, projects, that it was at cost to Malaysia, etc. I think the Prime Minister was very clear um, the problem Malaysia is facing with those couple of projects vis-a-vis -vis China, as well as the project that we have since suspended with uh, Singapore, the fault was very much with the previous government in Malaysia that we had entered into those projects, perhaps not in the wisest uh, fashion, etc. So just to make that clear, and I think you've captured that very well. I also want to make just a small referencing to uh, Shiv. Um, I agreed with the initial parts of what you were saying vis-a-vis -vis Malaysia, except for the last point, and this was during the visit of, the, of Prime Minister Mahathir to China and during the press, joint press conference he had with uh, Premier Li. Um, you suggested that he had made reference to China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, his referencing of a new form of colonialism. But if you were to revisit that um, uh, interview, that was actually his statement in response to Premier Li asking him about his view of the trade war going on between China and the US at that point in time. Of course, as a prime minister, he wouldn't want to make a, you know, a finding or uh, an opinion so directly about what is an ongoing issue. So his response which you referred to about new forms of colonialism, etc., was actually in response to that question rather than uh, the deals, uh, etc., that's being suspended with China. So just to clarify Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in front, uh, the last question. Sorry for the time, we're already uh, slightly over. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity. I think um, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative for Africa is uh, one of the best initiatives we have ever seen in uh, the global setting to address the uh, infrastructure deficit in Africa. You know, the main impediment for competitiveness in Africa is there is huge infrastructure deficit that has to be addressed. One of the ways uh, that China has supported Africa is uh, in building this infrastructure. The issue of a railway between Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, and uh, Djibouti was one of uh, the Belt and Road initiatives. And um, when it comes to the question, there is no country globally who has built infrastructure in commercial terms. None of the railways, even in Europe, has been profitable. So I think we have to understand that this is an initiative that helps to build yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in general, um, I think, uh, support and, and competitiveness that it brings uh, through the course of uh, the, the life of those infrastructure. 
to us in, uh, in East Africa, um, uh, one issue that China has to address is these uh, contracts has been made on commercial basis. And usually this kind of uh, uh, infrastructure should be built on concessional basis and China has to look into this kind of issues, you know, for, especially for developing countries. And the debt sustainability issue is a crucial and critical issue at this time. And that also has to be seen critically as mentioned earlier. So um, I think it's a good initiative, but there are issues that has to be addressed through course of uh, evaluating the successes. Thank you, sir. Any last comment? Yes, Dr. Yeah, Bayou. I, th I think um, learning from Indonesia, make your own plan for infrastructure development. I think that is the most fundamental. And after that, look for friends to help you, to support you. But if you very much depend only for the initiative, then you will find yourself sometimes in trouble, including try to count your own profitability and, and sustainability of your financial management. So that is, I think, the very basic. And with that notes, we will welcome the, the you know, BRI initiative. Well said. Okay, uh, just a one minute conclusion. Uh, I'm a short guy, I'm one meter six. I walk into a room, nobody notice, who cares? But if my name is Shaq O'Neill or LeBron James, I walk into a room, everybody will notice. And like it or not, China is not Ronnie Chan. China is a Shaq O'Neill or a LeBron James. And when he walks into anywhere, it matters. And I think the world will have, just have to learn to live with the fact that there is, besides the United States, besides EU, besides India, there's another big boy on the block. And without <laughs> which, I think the world will be a terrible one. So I just go back to three words, the first question the gentleman asked. He said, we need some courageous moves. Well, I suppose the Baron Road Initiative is quite courageous. The second word you use, sir, is self-centeredness. Well, as Dr. Bayou said, everybody better know how to care for his own interests. If any country, any individual doesn't know how to care for his or her own interest, perhaps you will be in trouble. Well, you will be in trouble. And uh, we're not talking about small guys. Every nation is a big guy. They better know how to take care of themselves they, so that they would not be taken advantage of by anybody, be it United States in the past or China today. Finally, uh, what kind of uh, uh, mechanism is, uh, should be there in order to guide the future of the Baron Road Initiative? I think it's a very good question. I think that whatever China say, the Europeans, some Europeans, and America is not going to believe it. So be it. They just have to learn to live with facts. Uh, and for example, uh, this is my last word. I think the West is right now in an echo chamber in a, in a, dark, uh, in a dark room. Uh, no, sorry, in a room full of mirrors. And then they put a straw man there. And then everywhere they turn, they see the same straw man and scare the heck out of themselves. <laughs> I think that America, in particular, but the United, uh, part of the rest of the world, is having a little bit of that problem. Echo chamber, a lot of mirrors, one straw man, and try to scare the heck out of themselves. Perhaps it is unnecessary, don't have a heart attack. I think China historically have always tried to work with its neighbors. Perhaps China will be a real positive force of peace and prosperity in the world rather than what you are afraid of. Uh, uh, last example, and that is what was said about uh, the South China Sea in the last session. You mentioned that we should touch upon the other sessions. I was just amazed. Nobody know the facts. Do you know about Cairo Declaration of 1943? All the land that Japan took from everybody has to be given back to its original owner. Who did they give back the whole South China Sea to? China, escorted by the 7th Fleet of the United States Navy. So America knows it, that all those Spratly and Paracel, South, Southeast China, were given back to China, escorted by the 7th Fleet of the United States. Now they are saying, oh, just because China is a Shaq O'Neill or LeBron James, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps China is not that 
big of a guy. Perhaps it's somewhere between Shaq O'Neal and Ronnie Chan. I think the, we have to learn to live with each other. And I'm, I, I want to thank Thierry for putting this conference together. I think it's very useful so that we can interact and, and, and discuss so that hopefully we'll get to know each, about, each other better. With that, I want to invite everyone to thank the three okay. great panelists I have here on stage. Thank you. Thank you.